Welcome to A Century of Cinema. Today I will be exploring my favourite films of 1984. First up, Wes Craven's A Nightmare on Elm Street. Nancy, played by Heather Langenkamp, and her friends Tina and Rod, and boyfriend Glenn, a very young Johnny Depp, are all experiencing nightmares about the same man, the now iconic Freddy Krueger, played to perfection by Robert Englund. Krueger was a child murderer who was later killed by the parents of the town after getting off on a technicality. Now he takes his revenge by killing their children in their dreams, as Nancy and co. discover when Tina is horrifically and supernaturally murdered in her sleep. He continues slashing away at the group, and it is up to Nancy, an ideal final girl, to try and stop him. A Nightmare on Elm Street is way up on the list of my favourite all-time horror movies, not just because it scared the crap out of me when I was 12. I mean, that scene with Tina in a body bag is still creepy as hell. It is also incredibly well made, especially when you consider the relatively minuscule budget. And writer-director Wes Craven gave the world the most creative and versatile horror villain probably ever. Fred Krueger can not only tear you to pieces literally, unlike most other movie monsters, he can also taunt you while he does it. He is a proper character, not just a blade-wielding maniac. The best scenes in the film are undoubtedly the dream sequences, with the aforementioned Tina in a body bag scene easily the standout for me. I mean, it's basically a flawless piece of horror filmmaking, with only the shower scene in Psycho, it's superior. And there are plenty of other truly memorable moments. The film that began my favourite horror franchise, A Nightmare on Elm Street, is obviously one of my favourite films of 1984. Places in the Heart, written and directed by Robert Benton, stars Sally Field as Edna Spaulding, a woman in Texas during the Depression, who, when her husband is shot by Argyle from Die Hard, must take care of the family farm. She is aided by Danny Glover's Moses, who uses his experience in cotton picking to help, and Will, a blind lodger, played by John Malkovich, who is somewhat antagonistic at first, but soon becomes part of the family. There's also a B story about Ed Harris's Wayne having an affair with Amy Madigan's Viola, but Honestly, I think that's that part just kind of gets in the way. Places in the Heart is directed and shot very well, with some lovely work from cinematographer Nesta Almendros, and there is a harrowing and incredibly well-done tornado scene, one of the best you'll ever see. But the true strength of the film is in its performances, particularly Glover, Malkovich, and Field. Danny Glover delivers easily one of his greatest performances as Moses, subtly exhibiting the deep pain of being a black man in the South of the time, and many other times, as well as being a source of strength for Edna and her family. John Malkovich, in his film debut, absolutely knocks it out of the park as well, giving us more than an inkling of the incredible career that would follow. But the star of the show is Sally Field as Edna, the role that would win her her second Oscar. This is a performance of both power and nuance, Edna is a sweet, inexperienced woman thrown into the deep end after the loss of her husband. She must use every ounce of strength to survive and keep her family intact. Field expertly and subtly demonstrates how Edna is barely keeping it together and portrays her as a fierce but tender and loving woman. Sally Field is my choice for best actress. Now you listen to me. If we lose this place and you're going back to begging for every single meal, and Mr. Wheel are going to put you in the state home, and I'm going to lose what's left of my family. I'm not going to let that happen. The Karate Kid, directed by John G. Avildsen and written by Robert Mark Kamen, stars Ralph Macchio as Daniel LaRusso, who is forced to move to L.A. for his mother's new job. He soon becomes interested in Ally, Elizabeth Shue, which attracts the attention of her ex, Johnny, William Zabka who, along with his buddies, begin to terrorise Daniel. They are members of the Cobra Kai dojo, run by the despicable John Kreese, Martin Cove. Daniel is helped by his apartment's handyman, Mr. Miyagi, Noriyuki Pat Morita, in his iconic role, who fends off the Cobra Kais and teaches Daniel karate, initially in a very roundabout but effective manner, basically by getting Daniel to do work around his house. The film culminates with Daniel facing off against the Cobra Kai in a karate tournament. John G. Avildsen, who directed Rocky eight years earlier, again expertly helms a classic underdog story, hitting many of the same beats as Rocky, but giving it a more Eastern flavour via the character of Miyagi. 
who was beautifully fleshed out by Marita, creating alongside screenwriter Kamen a character who has become legendary. Morita was nominated for Best Supporting Actor for his work in The Karate Kid, losing out to another Asian actor mentioned later in this video. The other performances are also played to a T. Zabka and Cove are perfectly hateable as Johnny and Kreese. Shu is warm and endearing as Ali, and Ralph Macchio is incredibly good as Daniel. He does most of, his, most of the heavy lifting in the movie, proving very authentic as a good-natured teen plagued with difficult situations showing real emotional range. And on top of that, there is some excellent work by cinematographer James Crave, with some truly beautiful shots in the mix. So, with gorgeous cinematography, skilled direction, a warm and witty screenplay, good performances, and the debut of a truly iconic character, The Karate Kid is definitely one of my favourite films of 1984. The Killing Fields, directed by Roland Joffe is based on the real-life events depicted in Sidney Shanberg's The Death and Life of Dick Pran, about events involving the Cambodian Khmer Rouge regime. Sam Waterston plays Sidney Shanberg, and Hang S. Noor, who actually lived through the Khmer Rouge, portrays Dick Pran. They are journalists documenting the Civil War, who witness some of the worst of what went on there. When they are forced to leave, Sidney and his compatriots which include John Malkovich in another great performance of 1984 as photographer Al Ruckoff, unsuccessfully attempt to forge a passport for Dith Pran, and he must stay to be imprisoned or killed. When Sidney gets back to the US, he begins a concerted effort to find his friend, who is in a labour camp, witnessing witness and victim of yet more atrocities at the hands of the Khmer Rouge. This is an extremely powerful and at times confronting film, adeptly directed by Joffe, with magnificent Oscar-winning cinematography by Chris Menges, richly deserved owing to deft action photography and some impossibly beautiful vistas, as well as a powerful adaptation of Shanberg's account, Bruce Robinson's first screenplay, and some brilliant performances all around, most notably from Malkovich Waterston, I think it's his best work, and the incredible Hang S. Noor, who won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. But for my money, he is at least the equal protagonist along with Waterston Sydney, and is by far the most compelling character. And the friendship between he and Sydney is the beating heart of Robinson's screenplay, which was nominated for an Oscar. But I'm going to go one better and give it Best Adapted Screenplay. And due to giving one of the greatest and most understandably authentic performances ever, because he ex actually experienced the horrors of the Khmer Rouge, Dr. Hang S. Noor is my choice for Best Actor of 1984. I know. You love my family, Sydney. But me, I'm a reporter too, Sydney. You know what I mean? Finally, who are you going to call? That's right, Ghostbusters. Directed by Ivan Reitman and written by Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis, it is the story of... Oh, come on, it's Ghostbusters. I don't need to get into the plot. Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Harold, Harold Ramis play the Ghostbusters. Peter Venkman, Ray Stance, and Egon Spengler. Later joined by Ernie Hudson's Winston Zeddemore. And they are all absolutely perfect in their roles. Bill Murray is, is at his absolute funniest here. Aykroyd is the heart of the movie. And Ramis is amazing as Egon. Sigourney Weaver as Dana, the focal point of the story and love interest for Venkman, is the ideal choice for both. She pretty much has to play it straight, but that was exactly what is required, and she absolutely nails it. And looks sexy as hell while doing it, if you don't mind me saying. Plus, you have the great supporting work from uh, Ernie Hudson, Rick Moranis as the Geeky Lewis, Annie Potts as wise-ass secretary Janine, and William Atherton in part one of his two-part journey of being the most despised characters of the 80s as EPA guy Walter Peck. So yeah, the cast is awesome. But let's talk about that screenplay. Aykroyd and Ramis crafted what was thought to be impossible, an action, sci-fi, horror, comedy that is actually awesome on all counts. There are great moments in practically every scene. Breaking this down to a few minutes is a freaking nightmare. And it is riddled with hilarious lines, most of which 
are delivered with flawless timing and charm by the inimitable Bill Murray. Worked seamlessly into the always on point dialogue. Everything was fine with our system until the power grid was shut off by Dickless here. They caused an explosion. Is this true? Yes, it's true. This man has no dick. And this is all brought together by Ivan Reitman, who keeps the pace ticking along brilliantly and balances all the disparate elements so they all work together in perfect harmony. It's easily his best work. Oh, and there's also an awesome soundtrack, with that infectious title track by Ray Parker Jr., and a truly excellent score by Elmer Bernstein, as well as great cinematography from Laszlo Kovacs. It is the first film I truly fell in love with, so excuse me for gushing a bit. So, for everything I've mentioned, and so much more, Ghostbusters gets Best Original Screenplay for Dan Aykroyd and Howard Ramis, Best Director for Ivan Reitman, and easily, Best Picture of 1984. We came, we saw, we kicked its ass! Join me next time on A Century of Cinema, when I'll be preoccupied with 19, 19, 1985. Now go watch a movie.